Good evening, University Church of Christ family. This is your evangelist, uh, Terrence McLean. Uh, we're thankful that God has allowed all of us the opportunity to come together tonight and to study from his holy and divine word. Uh, it is April 7th, 2021, and we are all alive today because of God's amazing grace. It is amazing grace because he is an amazing God. Before we get into our, our study, I would like to say to those who are, are joining us from uh, sister congregations, thank you for being here with us. Uh, to those who are on the telephone conference, uh, thank you so very much for joining us in our study tonight. Uh, for those of you who are not members of the body of Christ, the Church of Christ, uh, you are our honored guests. Thank you for joining us as we study God's holy and divine word. Certainly God has allowed all of us to be able to be alive, to be in our right mind, to be able to study God's word tonight. And our prayer is that you will be encouraged, uh, instructed, and grow in grace and the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Uh, before we begin our study tonight, uh, and before we read the text, uh, there are some announcements. Uh, Sister Ruth Wade requests prayer for her mother, Dolly B. Smith, who is now in the hospital. And we certainly want to continue to keep her in prayer. Uh, please keep Sister Linda McLean in prayer. Uh, she is no longer in the hospital uh, by the grace of God. And I was able to pick her up uh, on this uh, afternoon and she is now home and we are thankful that God has brought her home. Please continue to lift her uh, in prayer. Uh, Sister Patricia Gaines is in the hospital, so we want to continue to lift Sister Gaines in prayer. And we want to continue to pray for Brother Willie Blackwell, Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible study books for the spring are now available. Please call the church office to make arrangements to pick up your book or to have it delivered to you. Uh, continue to keep all those who have lost loved ones recently in your prayers, and there have been quite a few of us. Remember to pray for all our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters, their families, and all of those who are administering to the health and care of our loved ones. Uh, Sister McLean and I were able to get our second vaccination on last Thursday. Uh, I know that uh, many of our, our leaders, our elders and our deacons and their families have gotten their vaccinations as well. And I want to encourage everyone uh, to please be mindful that the pandemic is not over. Uh, in fact, the news was saying last night that even here in uh, Cleveland or in the state of Ohio, uh, the numbers were going up. Uh, we also are aware that, that Michigan has the highest numbers. Uh, they have been going up, uh, even though vaccinations are being given. So it's important uh, that we continue to, to remain safe, uh, wear our masks and do social distancing, um, and, and just be aware of the fact that we're still battling uh, the coronavirus pan pandemic. Uh, continue to pray for our leadership uh, here at the University Church of Christ, our elders, uh, Brother Frank Barnes, Brother Donald Nelson, and Brother Greg Shields and their families, uh, our deacons, uh, Brother F Freddie Gibson, and Brother Anthony Slade and their families. And of course, continue to keep Sister Linda McLean and I uh, in your prayers. Uh, as the evangelist and his wife and we work together with our elders and deacons along with all of the wonderful members of the university church to strive to do all that God would have us to do. Uh, we not only want you to pray for the leadership, pray for the entire uh, University Church of Christ uh, family, uh, but also pray for the body of Christ universal. Uh, we are one body. Uh, we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So let's pray for uh, the body of Christ around the world. And also, if you would like to zoom into our Thursday Bible study, and we are studying from the adult quarterly, from the Gospel Advocate, the Sunday morning lessons, and we are studying from 
uh, the Thessalonian letters. Uh, if you have not gotten your book or you have not been able to join us, call or email the church office in order to be added to the list so that they can help you uh, join by phone or by your computer uh, as we study God's holy and divine word. Tonight we're going to uh, pick up our study of the book of Psalms. Uh, pick up our study of the book of, of, of Psalms. Uh, I certainly want to thank all of you for your, your prayers, your concern for Sister McLean uh, and myself, but especially Sister McLean. Uh, as many of you are aware, I had to abruptly leave the uh, virtual worship on this past Sunday in order to take care of her. Uh, but thank you for your calls, your inquiries your prayers uh, so God has ha has raised her up and we are thankful to God God for that T tonight we're going to continue with our study from the book of, uh, of Psalms last week I believe we studied from Psalm chapter 46 God the refuge of his people but tonight we're going to study from Psalm 48 the city of the great king, the city of the great king. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, his holy mountain, Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. God in her palaces has made himself known as a stronghold. For lo, the kings assembled themselves, they passed by together, they saw it, then they were amazed. They were terrified, they fled in alarm. Panic seized them there. Anguish as of a woman in childbirth. With the east wind thou dost break the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish her forever. Selah. We have thought on thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. As is thy name, O God, so is thy praise to the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of thy judgments. Walk about Zion and go around her, count her towers. Consider her ramparts, go through her palaces, that you may tell it to the next generation. For such is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us until death. He will guide us until death. Pray with me. Gracious and eternal Father, holy and reverend is your name. Father, we bow before you tonight, thanking you for your long suffering, your love, your grace, your mercy. And Father, our prayer is that as we study your word, it'll be more than words on a page but that we will allow the Holy Spirit to use the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, to convict, to convert, to strengthen, and to encourage, and to edify, to instruct. Father, thank you for Jesus, your Son. He died on the cross for our sins. You. You raised him for our justification. And he's on your right hand making intercession for us. Even at this very moment. 
Thank you for answering our prayers in the past. And we know we can only come into your presence because of Jesus. Who said if we ask anything of you in his name you'll do it. We're mindful that it's not our will but your will that must be done. But we need your power, we need your strength, be with all of those who are sick and shut in, be with those who are in the hospital, Sister Dolly B. Smith, the mother of Sister Ray Wade, Sister Patricia Gaines is in the hospital, Brother Blackwell Jr. has gotten out of the hospital but still recovering, thank you for that, we thank you for bringing uh, my beloved wife, Sister Linda McClain, home today from the hospital and ask your continued healing upon her. Father, just bless us with all the things you see we stand in need of. Forgive us of our sins and keep us in your loving care. We'll always be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Now empower me as I teach your word. May I hide in the shadow of the cross. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The city of the great king. Again, these studies have been based on studies by Stephen J. Cole uh, many, many years ago in the book of Psalms. And... This particular one comes from March 22nd, 2009. Um, but I just love the way he does it, uh, the way he approaches the book of Psalms. So I'm using that as the springboard for our studies. Has it ever occurred to you that God describes heaven as a city? Heaven is the New Jerusalem. That's how it's referred to in the book of Revelation. So if you want to spend eternity in heaven, you'd better get used to city living. I know at least your neighbors in heaven will be perfect, but you will have neighbors. You know, many of us, we, we, we move out of the city into the suburbs because we want a little more space, or we move out in the country because... We want a little more peace and quiet. And, of course, many of us, when we talk about retiring, we want to retire and go down south where uh, the pace is a little slower and maybe it's not as congested. But in the Bible, cities are the desirable place to live. To live away from the city is to be unprotected from bandits, invading enemies, and predatory wild animals. It is to battle the elements. It is to cut yourself off from commerce, social relationships, and community support. The biblical mindset is this. Why in the world would anyone want to move out of the city into the wilderness? Here in America, there's also a cultural tendency towards individualism. We we prize the rugged individualist. When we relate to one another, we tend to compete rather than to cooperate. I'm going to repeat that. When we relate to one another in this country, we tend to compete rather than to cooperate. As American Christians, we rightly emphasize having a personal relationship with Christ, but sometimes we neglect to emphasize that the Christian life is more than just you and Christ. It necessarily makes you a part of his body, the church. You become a fellow citizen with the saints, a member of God's household. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, 
having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Now I want to I want to read that again. I want to make sure we grasp what he's saying. So that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building, not, not the brick and mortar, but the building, the body of Christ, being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So the Holy Spirit lives inside of us as individual Christians, as the temple of the Holy Spirit. But within the body of Christ, we collectively are the temple of the Lord. He's building. Mm -hmm. I, I never have been able to understand why so many people want to leave the place where God is doing the building and think it's all right. In whom you also are being, here's the phrase again, built together into a dwelling of God in, in the spirit. In the spirit. Put it another way, you become a citizen of God's, God's city. Psalm 48 sings the praises of Zion, the city of our God, the city of the great king. That's what it says in verses 1, 1 and 2. It is a companion to Psalm 46 and 47 in my New American Standard Bible. Uh, the title of Psalm 46, God the Refuge of His People. Psalm 47, God the King of the Earth. Psalm 48, the beauty and glory of Zion. Mm -hmm. All three of these psalms proclaim God's victory over His enemies. Psalm 46, 4 also refers to to the city of God, the dwelling place, says of the Most High. Commenting on the Old Testament theology of Zion, Wilhelm van Gimmeren writes in his Expositor's Bible Commentary, volume 5, page 355, the following. The psalmist affirms that God's beneficent rule belongs only to the godly the residents of Zion. Mount Zion stands for the vision of God's kingship. God's kingdom is greater than Jerusalem, but receives its visible expression in the temple and palace of Jerusalem. Yahweh has chosen to establish his kingdom and delights in those who submit themselves to his rule. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. The Zion theology slash eschatology inspires God's people with adoration, joy, hope, and commitment to the great king. The godly are those who live and act in anticipation of the vision of Zion. This hope was the basis for ethics, praise, and evangelism as we have read in verses 8 through 14 in Psalm 48. But I want to remind you tonight, or whenever you're watching this uploaded on YouTube or watching it later on Facebook, I want to remind you that this vision of, a city, of Zion as God's city and dwelling place is not just for the Jews. The New Testament applies this Old Testament vision to the church. 
In Galatians 4 and verse number 26, Paul says, But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Look back at Ephesians chapter 2. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul goes to great lengths in verses 11 through 22 to show that the Gentiles now have become partakers with the Jews of the covenants of, of promise. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse number 11. Watch this. Therefore remember that formerly you the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of, of Christ. Mm -hmm. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances that in himself he might make the two, talking about Jew and Gentile, into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. That means in himself by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both, talking about Jew and Gentile, have our access in one spirit to the Father. And then, of course, I read verses 19 through 22. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. I honestly believe that we wouldn't have some of, of the confusion and the animosity and, and, and the backbiting and the divisiveness uh, even in local congregations if we fully comprehended the fact that God is building us up together so his spirit can dwell not just in us as individuals but in us as a body of believers. Uh, I, uh, I, I, my wife said, mm, I, I'm glad she said something because I, I can't hear nothing from the rest of y'all out there. Being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. The author of Hebrews contrasts the terrifying fear of those who received the law at Mount Sinai with the reverent awe of those who have received the new covenant. So he says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, 
and to the spirit of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new cup. There is a lot of meat in those verses. Because the Hebrew writer says to those Hebrew Christians that the, the book of Hebrews was directed to who were going back into the Levitical system, he said, wait a minute, you're going to the wrong Mount Zion. We are now the heavenly, the spiritual Mount Zion and, and the city of the living God. We are the heavenly Jerusalem. And you have come to myriads of angels, to the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. You've come to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And you've come to Jesus, who is the mediator of a new covenant. Don't go back to the old Mount Zion. Don't go back to the old physical Jerusalem. You need to understand that it has been ele elevated to a spiritual dimension. And so that's what John was talking about in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 3, when, when he wrote these words, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now that's, that's your shouting point right there. Because the church is the bride of Christ, Ephesians chapter 5. So he says, this holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband, it's talking about the church, the, the body of Christ, the family of God. Watch what he said. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And then later in verses 9 and 10, he specifically identifies this new Jerusalem as the wife of the Lamb. Now, I know I, I alluded to Ephesians 5, but I want you to turn there. I, I, I want you to see it. I want you to see that it's referring to the bride of Christ, his wife, his church. Watch this. Starting at verse 23, and, and, and sisters, don't, don't panic. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going here for the husband being the head of the wife and your submission and all that kind of stuff. So, But it's here. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Now, early in Ephesians chapter 1, Verse 22 and 23, it says, He has put all things under his feet and gave into the head over all things to the church, which is his, his body. So, here in verse 23, he's the Savior of the body. Verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Uh, wives, I would feel sorry for you if it weren't for verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, mm -hmm. that he might sanctify her, what, the church, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. 
So husbands are also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Because we are members of his body. We are members of his body. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each individual among you also love his own wife, even as himself, and let the wife see to it that she respect her, her husband. The, the Lamb of God has a wife. He has a bride. She is the church. So why do so many Christians even mistreat the wife of Christ, the body of Christ? When we mistreat each other, we are mistreating the bride of Christ. Hmm. So while Psalm 48 is about the Jewish vision of Zion as God's city and dwelling place, in light of the New Testament, we may legitimately apply it to the church, which has been grafted into believing Israel. And that's in Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 24. Just as God promises to establish Zion forever in Psalm 48, 8, so Jesus promised to establish his church forever. Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We are God's temple. We are his dwelling place. So Psalm 48 has a direct application to us. Psalm 46 and 48 both seem to have been written in response to some stupendous deliverance of Jerusalem from powerful enemies that threatened to annihilate it. While scholars differ and we cannot be dogmatic I am inclined to view it as the deliverance under King Hezekiah from Zanacharib's powerful army described in 2 Kings chapter 18 verses 17 through 19 through chapter 19 verse 37 and then 2 Chronicles chapter 32 and Isaiah 36 37 but I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. Whoever this deliverance is from it's God giving the deliverance. The army, Zanacharib's army, had been unstoppable and it now surrounded Jerusalem. It looked doomed, but in response to Hezekiah's and Isaiah's prayers, the angel of the Lord went out and killed 185,000 of Zanacharib's troops in one night. We talked about this last week. He returned, defeated to Nineveh, and was murdered by his sons as he worshipped in his idol temple. But whatever the historical situation, the psalm joyously proclaims God's greatness as seen in the splendor of his city, which he miraculously delivered. While parts of the psalm would almost lead you to think that he is praising the beauty of Zion, the first and last verse serve to show that it's actually a psalm about the greatness of God as seen through his city. God's city is to proclaim and praise the praise of his salvation to all the earth and to succeeding generations. The psalm falls into three segments. Verses 1 through 3 show that God's city is to proclaim his greatness, holiness, joy, and power. 
verses 1 through 3 show that God's city is to proclaim his greatness, holiness, joy, and power. Verses 4 through 8 show God miraculously saving his city from powerful enemies. Again, verses 4 through 8 show God miraculously saving his city from powerful enemies. And then in verses 9 through 14, it show that God's city should praise him for his great salvation and spread his praise to the ends of the earth and to the next generation. So point number one, believe it or not, all of that was the introduction. <laughs> God's city is to proclaim his greatness, holiness, joy, and power. Verses one through three. Letter A is this, God's city is to proclaim his greatness, verse 1. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. How can we ever praise God in proportion to his infinite greatness? It's impossible. Maybe the heavenly chorus will come the closest when the millions and millions of saints and angels join together to sing God's praise. But even that will fall short because his greatness is far beyond the highest heaven. But here below, we should not give up just because it's impossible. We should worship him with all our being. When visitors come into our midst, they should conclude these people must be worshiping a great God because they are so caught up in wonder and love and praise. Join me and the elders and the deacons in praying that as a church, we will give our great God the great praise that he deserves. God's city is to proclaim his greatness, verse 1. God's city, letter B, is to proclaim the beauty of his holiness, 1B and verse 2. The psalmist describes God's city as his holy mountain and adds that it is beautiful in elevation. Jerusalem, of course, is at an elevation of 2,500 feet above sea level. So their writers talk about going up to Jerusalem as in Psalm 122 and verse 4. But the theological sense of beautiful and elevation is well expressed by A.A. A. Anderson, cited by Van Gameren. Quote, it is here that in a sense heaven and earth meet. Unquote. The city's holiness and beauty, not to mention its strength, are due to the fact that God dwells there with his people. The world probably thinks of holiness as being rather dry or boring, but in the Bible, God, who is holy, is beautiful. Psalm 27 and verse 4, Isaiah 33 and verse 17. Psalm 96 and verse 6 declares, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Thus God's people yes. who are to be holy as he is holy, Leviticus 11.44, mm -hmm. are to display the Lord's beauty. Mm -hmm. Psalm 50 and verse 2 says, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shown forth. Sin is always ugly in its final form. Holiness is beautiful or attractive. As God's people, we are to display his holiness to a sinful and ugly world. It is vital that we judge our sin and labor to make the church a holy people. Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. We often quote it. But I wonder if we really think about the seriousness of it. Hmm. Titus chapter 2, beginning at verse number 11. For the grace of God has appeared to all men. 
bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. God's city, you and I, the people of God, the church of Christ, this holy city, we are to declare the beauty of his holiness, proclaim his greatness. Uh, as I was reading those texts, I, I thought about a song that I heard many, many years ago uh, in Trinidad for the first time. And then when we came back, I found out that it's being sung around the United States and I remember this song, it touched me so much because it reminded us that God is preparing us so that he can live in us individually and in a local body of believers. And the words of the song say, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving I'll be a blessing Lord let me be a sanctuary for you wow a sanctuary when people come into our midst when we do assemble do they sense they're in the midst of the sanctuary of God and I'm not talking about the physical building because we are the lively stones. God's city is to proclaim his greatness. God's city is to proclaim the beauty of his holiness. Let us see. God's city is to proclaim the joy of being his people. In verse 2. The psalmist calls God's city the joy of the whole earth. Again, the world does not think of holiness and joy in the same breath unless the contrast them as opposites, but they always go together in the Bible. The most difficult phrase to interpret in the psalm is that Mount Zion is, quote, in the far north, unquote. The NIV trans transliterates the Hebrew word for north as Zaphon, which was a pagan mountain north of Ugarit where Baal was worshipped. This line of interpretation argues that Israel borrowed from Canaanite and other pagan religions the idea that the supreme place where the gods reign was a mountain in the north. But the Jews contended that the living and true God reigned in the north on Mount Zion. This view claims for support Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 13 where the king of Babylon arrogantly claims, quote, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north, unquote. Mm -hmm. Derek Kickner understands, quote, the far north in 48.2 to use this imagery to connect the earthly Mount Zion with the heavenly one in his commentary on Psalms Psalm 1 through 72, page 179. But other commentators like Franz Delich or J.A.A. A. Alexander or J.J.S. Peron argue that the Jews would never have used this pagan mythological idea to describe God's dwelling in Zion. These writers take the phrase to refer to some geographic aspect of Mount Zion, although it is not clear exactly how this fits, so I do not know how to explain it. But don't let the difficulty cause you to miss the point that as the city of the great king, we are to extend God's joy to the whole earth. To proclaim his joy, we must be experiencing it as we rejoice daily in his great salvation. Thus God's city should proclaim his greatness, his holiness, and his joy. 
And then God's city is to proclaim his power. Letter D, verse 3. God in her policies has made himself known as a stronghold. The next few verses go on to portray a coalition of powerful kings coming up to conquer the city, but they aren't able to raise a hand against it. When they see it, they tremble, panic, and flee. The cause of their terror is not just the impressive walls and towers of the city, but the God who dwells in the city. As J.J.S. Perone puts it in the, his book, The Book of Psalms, published by Zondervan, on page 389, quote, It is the glory of his presence which makes her glorious. The strength of his presence which makes her safe. I love that. Mm -hmm. It is the glory of his presence which makes her glorious. The strength of his presence which makes her safe. End quote. The people of God's city should know him in a very practical way as their stronghold when they face trouble. Nahum chapter 1, verse number 7. We sing a song. The Lord our rock in him we hide. A shelter in the time of a storm. A shelter. Jesus is a rock. In a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. You see, God's city, the New Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, the bride of the Lamb, the church of Christ, is to realize that we are glorious because God is glorious. His glory is in the midst of us. We are safe because He is in the midst of us. This point is related to the earlier point about holiness as we rely on God's Spirit to live holy lives in this corrupt world. We display His power. It is another tragedy. tragedy when those that claim to know God are exposed for living a secret life of sin. May it never be said of us. Thus the first section of the psalm makes the point that God's city is to proclaim his greatness, holiness, joy, and power. His power is especially displayed in the second section in verses 4 through 8. God saves his city and will establish her forever. There are two points here. Letter A, God saves the city from powerful foes that unite to destroy it. Verse 4 pictures these kings joining together, passing by the city to size it up. Before they actually see it, they are proud and confident. But then in verse 5, they saw it, they were amazed, terrified, and they fled in alarm. In Hebrew, there are four church verbs in close succession here. It reminded Calvin of Caesar's famous boast, I came, I saw, I conquered. But here, they came, they saw, and they fled in panic. The psalm used two metaphors to describe their fear. First, they were in anguish as of a woman in childbirth in verse 6. Second, they were like ships on the Mediterranean Sea, broken up by an east wind in verse 7. The ships of Tarshish represent the strongest and largest ships. When you get a chance, look at 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 22. But when God raises a powerful wind, these ships are like matchsticks, tossed and broken up by the sea. I know you're going to study this a little later, so when you get a chance, look at Ezekiel chapter 27, verses 25 through 27. That's Ezekiel chapter 27, verses 25 through 27, and then Revelation chapter 18, verses 17 through 20. Revelation 18, verses 17 through 20. Calvin, in his commentary, applies these verses by pointing out that the church can expect to be assailed by powerful enemies. God uses such assaults to humble us and to demonstrate his own great power. 
Then he adds, quote, At the same time, let us remember that a nod alone on the part of God is sufficient to deliver us. Wow. Thus we should look to God alone and not to human help. Hmm. Let it be God's salvation of his city changes hearsay into experience. Verse number eight. As we have heard, so we so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish her forever. Israel had heard stories of how God in the past had delivered his people from annihilation, but now they had seen it firsthand. This should be the testimony of every true child of God. You have heard of how God has saved others, but now he has saved you. You can add your story to that of others that the Lord of hosts has rescued you from Satan's destructive grasp. He has placed you in his city, in his church, in the new Jerusalem, in the bride of Christ, which he will establish forever. This brings us to the final section. Number three, God's city should praise him for his great salvation and spread his praise to the ends of the earth to the next generation, verses 9 through 14. There are five thoughts here that I can only talk, touch upon. My time is running out. Letter A, our experience of God's salvation should deepen our thoughts of his love. Verse 9. We have thought upon your loving kindness, O God, in the midst of your temple. Specifically, they were thinking of how God had demonstrated his love in saving them from destruction. Remember what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verse number 8. I'm going to quote it from the King James Version. But God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet mm -hmm. sinners, Christ died for us. Those of us who have obeyed the gospel, who've heard the gospel, believed the gospel, repented of our sins, confessed with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's Son, and been buried in water for the remission of our sin. When we think about the fact that He has made us free, and remember Jesus said that if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If He has freed you from the guilt of your past sins, if he has freed you from the penalty of your past sins, if he is sanctifying you now and freeing you from the power of sin, and one day when we get to glory, he will free us from the very presence of sin. When we think about what God has done to save us when we did not deserve it, it ought to cause us to love him deeply. Let it be our experience of God's salvation should go from us to the ends of the world. Mm -hmm. Quote, as is your name, O God, so is your praise to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is full of righteousness. Mm -hmm. As the story of how God delivered Jerusalem spread, so did his praise. His righteousness refers to his righteous judgment on the wicked kings who sought to destroy God's people. As many scriptures make clear, if we have experienced God's salvation, then we are to spread God's praise and glory to the ends of the earth. And when we proclaim the gospel, we must not neglect the tale of God's righteousness. When you get a chance, look at Acts chapter 24, verse 25. Tonight, April 7th, 2021, 7.55 p.m., People in our world, in our cities, in our states, in our country, in our neighborhoods need a savior. 
precisely because they will face a God whose right hand is full of righteousness. And then let us see our experience of God's salvation should cause us to rejoice in his righteous judgments. Verse 11. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgment. The daughters of Judah refers to the smaller town surrounding Jerusalem. The cause of their joy, if this refers to Sennacherib's invasion, was 185,000 dead bodies of the Assyrian army. Many today that purport to believe in Christ at the same time are repulsed by the biblical view of God's righteous judgment. Many others tolerate his judgment, but they don't like it. But the Bible portrays God's saints as rejoicing when he pronounces judgment on wicked Babylon in Revelation chapter 18, verse number 20. Maybe we have been tainted too much by our tolerant culture and need to rethink this one. If we're saved, we should rejoice in his, his, his judgments. Because he judged our sins at Calvary. Hello. Letter D, our further meditation on God's salvation should impel us to tell it to the next generation. Verses 12 and 13. The residents of Jerusalem have been cooped up within the walls of the city because of Zennacherib's troops outside. But now the troops are dead, and so the psalmist invites the people of God to take a stroll around the city. Count her towers. They're all standing intact with no damage from battering rams. Consider her ramparts. They're unscathed. Go through her palaces. They're still magnificent. Then tell the next generation who weren't yet alive to see this firsthand what the Lord did to save his people. These verses are not encouraging God's people to put their trust in Jerusalem's towers and ramparts. Rather, to see them still standing is a testimony of God's faithfulness toward his people. That is worth handing off to the next generation. Unfortunately, too many of us as Christians, we want to brag to the next generation about how good we are. We better be telling them about God's amazing grace and that if it were not for his grace, we would not be standing today. Mm-hmm. Hello. Letter E, God's salvation means that we will praise him for forever. Mm-hmm. Verse 14 ties the end of the psalm back into verse 1. God is great. And greatly to be praised. This God is our God forever and ever. He will guide us even unto death. Some versions read he will guide us forever. But the sense is essentially the same. We can trust and follow And praise this God because he is faithful to deliver his people. Not even the most powerfully evil rulers in this world can thwart his loving purposes for those who dwell in his city. The new Jerusalem. The heavenly city. The bride of the Lamb. The church of Christ of our Lord. We will always have his protection, even in death. As I conclude this lesson tonight, in 1956, five young missionaries were speared to death by the Aka Indians as they sought to take the gospel to that primitive tribe. One of those men was Roger Uderian. His wife, Barbara, wrote in her journal, quote, Tonight the captain told us with a capital C of his finding four bodies in the river. One had T-shirt and blue jeans. Raj was the only one who wore them. 
God gave me this verse two days ago, Psalm 48, 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. As I came face to face with the news of Roger's death, my heart was filled with praise. He was worthy of his home going. Help me, Lord, to be both mommy and daddy. To know wisdom and instruction. That's in a book by Elizabeth Elliot, Through Gates of Splendor, page 191. This song teaches us that the history and destiny of God's people is inextricably linked with God himself. Knowing that this God is our God gives us a sense of peace when we're under attack. It gives us a sense of purpose to serve his great cause of spreading his glory to every people. It gives us a sense of belonging to be a part of city of this great king. Mm -hmm. Don't despise the church. Don't be a lone ranger Christian. Mm -hmm. Don't move to the country away from God's people. God's purpose is bound up with the city. Mm -hmm. Move into his city and join together with the citizens of Zion and proclaiming the praise of his salvation to all the earth and to succeeding generations. Make sure you're a citizen of the great city of the great king. As I close this lesson tonight, some of you watching or listening, whenever you may be watching or listening, might not yet be Christians, might not yet be married to Christ, the bridegroom. The Bible says that the gospel is God's power unto salvation, Romans 1, verse 16. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day according to the scriptures. You need to hear that gospel, that he died, that he was buried, and that he got up from the dead. He went back to heaven, and one day he's coming back again for his bride, the wife of the Lamb. Are you willing to believe that he died for your sins? And that he's the only savior and you cannot save yourself? Are you willing to repent of your sin? And sin is just really running your own life apart from God. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Acts 17 and 30, the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Repent of your sins. Confess with the mouth the sweetest name on mortal tongue. We sing the song often. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Will you make that confession that he is the Christ, the son of the living God? And then be buried, baptized in water for the remission of sins. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, All power, all exousia, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Acts 2.47, praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Romans 6, 3 and 4, when you're baptized, when you're baptized into his death, buried by baptism into the death of Christ, to arise to walk in the newness of life. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, for you all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you're a child of God, why don't you make up in your mind to live worthy of being a part of the city of the great king? Pray with me. Gracious Father, thank you for this day, for the opportunity to teach your word. Thank you for everyone who was on 
whether they are on live or they're watching it later on Facebook or watching it later on YouTube or they're on the teleconference call. Father, my prayer is that for children of God, we've been strengthened and encouraged, edified. Mm -hmm. and for those who have not yet embraced the gift of your son, Jesus, may your Holy Spirit take the word that was preached and taught convict them of the need of the salvation that's in Christ mm -hmm. and give them the courage to say no to Satan and yes to you before it's everlasting and eternally too late be with us as we will shortly leave this platform but we're mindful we're never out of your presence watch over protect us keep us safe till the next appointed time we come together in Jesus name we pray Amen. For all of you who are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. And whether you're a Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus' sake. You can look over in the chat and you can see our website, our telephone number, how to reach us so that we can help you in your obedience to the gospel of Christ. May God bless you and may he keep you in his loving care.